Oh, that was quite the introduction. Thank you so much, Vivek. And embarrassing. I, I was embarrassed at first, but then I thought, no, go on. It's actually really nice. And uh, we could just keep talking, but just adjourn and go to the snacks. So. Wow, well, it is so uh, exciting. Uh, I'm delighted and excited to be here for a number of reasons. First of all, I mean, this is just Cornell. I mean, who wouldn't want to speak here? you know, one of the great universities in the world. Uh, second, uh, to be at an event that is sponsored by the Chesterton House. I mean, Chesterton was one of my heroes, one of my gratitude heroes. And, uh, you know, he was a man of uh, tremendous intellect and wit and girth, right? <laughs> he was like, uh, well, you can see him right there. Just like that, right? Six, five, like 350 pounds or something like that. Uh, but he was also eminently quotable. And uh, one of my favorite quotes was, uh, he, he was asked, so he was a prolific author, right? So they asked him, like, if you were stranded on a, on a desert island, you know, deserted, right? What one book would you want to have with you? And you know what he said? He thought about it for just a split second. And he said, why, a practical book on shipbuilding, of course, right? <laughs> Makes sense, right? Well, anyway, um, funny guy. Um, 37 years ago, the very first talk I gave, like a, a job talk, job interview, was here at Cornell uh, in psychology. Okay. And by the way, no, I didn't get the job, uh, but uh, worked out good for both Cornell and myself. And so now I'm actually retired uh, professor emeritus at UC Davis. So now I'm on the other end. So this is kind of like a bookend, you know, being able to start here and then finish here. Well, I'm not quite finished, I guess, but you know what I mean? Uh, it's nice to have this kind of symmetry uh, at different ends of my professional career. Uh, and lastly, as Viveka also mentioned, uh, Garrett, my son is in the audience tonight with his mom, so it's great for them to be here. Uh, that makes it also special for me. So what I wanna do, I'm not quite as um, organized. I kind of actually take the Chesterton approach. I heard that when he gave a lecture or participate in a debate, had like a whole sheaf of papers that, you know, would kind of fall on the ground and get all mixed up and that sort of thing. That often happens to me as well. But uh, I do want to talk about gratitude. And then I want to tell you basically what I think it is, what it's about, uh, why it matters, how it works, and then address the big question which framed uh, this lecture, which is, is gratitude the greatest of the virtues or is it something less than that? Is it you know, the undignified badge of surrender, right? And can we adjudicate between those two poss possibilities or maybe try to reconcile them? Maybe one is right, maybe one is wrong, maybe they're both right, you know? So we'll try to figure it all out and sort it all out in the next uh, 40 minutes. Well, I have a timer, which I never use. And when I said it, when I talk, it really means nothing at all, but I'll try to stick, because we have to be out of here by five minutes to seven because of a um, terrible thing, Here's an exam. Okay. So over the last two thirds of those 37 years that I've been in the business, uh, my work has been devoted to declaring and demonstrating this basic point that gratitude is the deepest touch point of human existence now i know that doesn't sound very scientific you should phrase it in terms of a question not a declarative statement like that maybe is gratitude the deepest touch point of human existence now i don't know about you but if i saw something like that or heard someone say something like that i would ask myself like how can that be how can gratitude or anything else for that matter be the deepest touch point of human, what does that even mean uh, for that matter, right? Well, that sounds kind of like maybe hyperbole or an exaggeration, but I can assure you that at least as extreme statements have been made by other people over thousands of years about the nature of gratitude, because it is in fact been called the greatest of the virtues. Uh, it's been called the secret to life, the key that opens all doors, right? Uh, one of my favorites is the most passionate transformative force in the cosmos which I don't know what that means either. That sounds pretty impressive, right? They all do. They're all very inspiring. And, um, you know, as a scientist who does, you know, collect data and crunch numbers, I don't want to take these statements, these, these sayings, these maxims at face value. I wanted to see if graduate actually delivers on its promise and on its potential. So I started doing research now 23 years ago on the nature of graduate, trying to measure it, trying to see if we could 
get people to actually experience gratitude and the difference that would make in their lives in a variety of different ways. Okay. First though, you have to start by defining what your topic is, what your concept is, you know? And so I like to think about gratitude this way. Now, most of would say it's like being thankful, right? Being appreciative, saying thanks, thank you. We could define gratitude in two words, right? What's, what's the big mystery? Well, in fact, it's much more than that because gratitude has taught me many things, one of which is that it's much more complicated than it appears to be on the surface, that there's so many layers and levels and nuances to it. We can't just reduce it to simply a behavior of, of politeness, of civility, of courtesy, as important as that is, it goes way deeper than that. So I like to think about it as two different stages of information processing. One is just affirming that there is goodness, that there is something good. I look at my life, I look at others, I look at the world around me, I say yes to life. There's an affirmation of the good. That doesn't mean that there's only good, of course. That doesn't mean that there isn't badness, there isn't uh, trials and tribulations and suffering. I just choose to notice the good, look for the good, focus on the good, try to absorb that and take in the good. That's the starting point for gratitude. But that's not enough, because if you just had that, you might feel some other emotion, right? If you just focused on the good, you might feel what, for example? What other pleasant emotions are there? happy, you might feel happy, right? Suppose good things happen to you and because you work really hard and you took credit for those good things, you might feel pride, pride, right, or proud. So there's a lot of other positive emotions. What makes gratitude gratitude is not just it's about affirming the good, we also recognize where that good comes from, where it came from. We attribute it to sources outside of ourselves. So very hard to be grateful to yourself, right? Uh, one time I was at a conference and uh, a graduate student followed me around for three days, insisting you could be grateful to yourself and trying to prove that. I wasn't impressed though. I mean, I was impressed by his tenacity and his grit, but not by the arguments, because I think it requires another person or being or source outside of yourself to be grateful for. You just don't write thank you notes to yourself, right? Nobody does that. So um, it does originate outside the self in a number of different sources personal, impersonal, supernatural, animal, even institutional, right? There's a whole range of different things we can be grateful for and people are on a regular basis. And that's one of the things which makes gratitude so interesting is that virtually any experience, any situation, any context can elicit feelings of gratefulness. Well, gratitude has really been taking off the science. It's really accelerated over the last 15 years or so. So on this graph, this is just one database. This is just from the medical journal PubMed database. And it shows the number of publications in peer reviewed journals over the last like almost 60 years, right? From 65 up to the present. And the biggest bar, as you can see, is from 2010 to the present. So the last 12 years, 13 years, there's actually been more research studies than in the previous 50 years. So what we know about gratitude, pretty new, pretty recent. Okay. We didn't know much until about the turn of the century, and then there started to be a small rise in the number of studies. Now, the number of studies has just really exploded. The mountain of data on gratitude is so tall, so high, no one person can scale it. It's the river of data is so wide, no one person can navigate it. It's like, in the early days, I used to be able to say, okay, I know the studies, you know, and someone did a research study, I know who they were, what they did, what they found, and so on. And now it's just hundreds, literally several hundred studies. And so if you have a question about any topic, how it's related to graduate, I guarantee there's a study on it. Well, not quite a guarantee, very close to a guarantee. If there's not, I'd say, well, you should do that study because that would be interesting because we don't know that and we need to learn that. So a lot of data, a lot of new studies, cutting edge science being applied to a concept which goes back thousands of years to ancient you know, writings, philosophical writings, and religious writings, spiritual traditions. So I like to say that I study gratitude using the methods of today, even though the concept is quite old, it's old fashioned, but in a brand new way, using the methods of science. The key question that I began with could be a question uh, that Chesterton himself was uh, immersed in. What's the connection between gratitude and happiness? And Chesterton said that the test of all gratitude is happiness, that happiness and gratitude really go together. If you are, if you are grateful, you will be happy. And uh, again, I wanted to test this out empirically by collecting data. Is expressing gratitude the key to unlocking and unleashing the power of 
gratitude and of gratefulness. How would you test this out using experimental methods? Okay. And so right from the start, that well, the way to do this is to conduct randomized controlled trials using experimental methods, right? Have people focus on gratitude, ask them to do something that would raise their level of gratefulness. So we asked them to keep gratitude journals. It seemed like a good and fairly easy thing to do. Most people can pick that up very easily. Not a lot of instruction is needed about how to do that. Go home tonight, write down three, four, five things you're grateful for. Do that tomorrow night, the next night, two weeks, three weeks, varying periods of time. It doesn't have to be a night to do the morning, any time of day. It's just a regular reflective, intentional practice to focus on gratitude. Okay, so these are randomized controlled trials. So we need people doing other things. So we'd ask them to write about stressors or hassles or just daily events. So various comparison groups, various uh, amounts of time, we vary the instructional set. Over 10,000 people have been in these studies, not my own, but people now all over the world who have taken our original approach and methodology and then have expanded upon that and looked at gratitude in various uh, populations, healthy, unhealthy, young, old, between the ages of eight to over 80, 10,000 people now have been in these randomized controlled trials. So when I talk about in a minute about the benefits of gratitude, uh, I'm gonna talk either about people who are becoming grateful because they've been in these reflective studies and the journaling is not the only way to do it, by the way, but it works pretty well and pretty quickly and pretty reliably. Uh, also, we measured gratitude as a trait or a disposition. We developed a questionnaire some years ago called the GQ stands for Gratitude Questionnaire. Pretty clever, right? Um, should I use regular language? Here's a good example of it. So the GQ is measuring how frequently you feel grateful. I don't have to read the, the questions. It's not important. But these are just self-reported questions about your attitudes. How grateful a person do you think you are? How often do you feel grateful when you feel it? How strongly is that on a you know seven-point scale, six-point scale that we use? Span is how broad. So how many things are you grateful for at any one time in your life? And then gratitude density is for any one thing that you have, any one source, circumstance, relationship, job, whatever it is, uh, who do you attribute that? How many different sources are behind that or causes are behind that one thing that you're grateful for? We call this the four facets or four dimensions of gratefulness. So some of the data that are reported when you read about gratitude research and gratitude science, they will talk about grateful people do this or grateful people feel that or grateful people have this in their lives. That's usually the meaning dispositionally grateful people as opposed to people who are temporarily made to feel grateful through one of these reflective exercises. All righty. Uh, we also can talk about gratitude as a virtue. And, and that's a big part of, of course, the way I've um, framed the comparison tonight. Is gratitude a virtue or is it a a potential vice, uh, perhaps in different ways. So Tony Manella is a philosopher at Siena College, which I think is in Albany. Uh, and he has written uh, quite extensively about the nature of, if you wanna learn anything about gratitude in, in depth, he's the person to read uh, Manella, especially from a virtue perspective. And he says that gratitude is basically the disposition to form and sustain a properly grateful response to the right people at the right time and to the right degree which then kind of echoes what's been said you know, thousands of years ago by people like Cicero, who said that gratitude is not only the greatest of virtues, but the parent of all the others. So whether we look at gratitude you know, as this disposition or as a virtue, very similar, right? It's a disposition to feel gratitude frequently, regularly, intensely, but the proper time, the proper place, and the proper way of expressing it. Okay, what have we learned about gratitude? I'm gonna skip over a lot of the methodology. There's a lot to cover. This is like a introductory basic kind of crash course in gratitude science tonight. And the story of gratitude is long, but unfortunately our time is short. So I kind of have to move quickly and skip over a lot. I wanna put up this panel. That's why there's so much information on one screen. You know, instead of doing six, I just jam it all in one and break five out of the four rules of PowerPoint. By doing it this way, well, I like that because it shows you six different research programs on what's been learned about the power of grateful living. From emotional well-being, which was what I was interested in studying, happiness, joy, contentment, flourishing, all those things that we most want out of life. Guess what? Gratitude matters. We found that gratitude raises people's level of happiness, changes the set point as much as 15 to 20%. Over time, both pre and post, doing gratitude exercise or when you compare those different groups who are assigned different tasks. 
Uh, relationally, grateful people get along better with others. They have better life. Their relationships are stronger, more fulfilling. They get and give more social support. They're more generous, compassionate, giving, forgiving. They pay it forward. Uh, all good things, right? So relational well-being, psychological or emotional well-being, they actually achieve more. So motivationally, people, who, when they practice gratitude, they're more successful at actually achieving their goals, working toward those goals, making progress, but yet not being satisfied with how much progress they, they keep striving, keep persevering, keep showing determination and achieving these goals. And then the bottom two, super important, because we find that gratitude not only turns up the volume on the good stuff in our lives, but also turns down the volume on the bad things, like reactions to stress, okay? whether it's the, the, the small, the slow drip of everyday stress, or the major catastrophic losses and turmoil, and big stressors, grateful people do better, they're more resilient to trauma, they're less bothered by everyday stress, they get depressed less often, now, it doesn't mean they never get depressed, of course, but these are trends and tendencies and probabilities. On average, very few people are less depressed. Their episodes of depression when they are depressed are shorter, smaller. Um, they recover more quickly from that. So what we have is many findings. The effect sizes are pretty strong. We're talking about usually 15 to 20 to 25% changes, which are sustainable over time. Six months, a year later, still find some benefits to those who were originally in the gratitude condition. Um, any domain you look at, whether it's relational, academic, athletic, physical, we'll take a look at surely, gratitude appears to work. The grateful mind, the grateful heart, reap advantages across domains. I haven't yet found a domain in which gratitude makes life worse. But let's try. We might try tonight. And it seems to be theme. Right? Good medicine. Yeah. So I do a lot of speaking for healthcare, doctors, physicians. Uh, healthcare settings, and they're quite interested for their own health. First of all, doctors realizing healthcare professionals, it's good to practice gratitude, brings them some stress relief, maybe reduces burnout. Not maybe, it actually does. Um, it, with our, in our own lives, we find that grateful people sleep better. 15 to 80% better sleep per night, uh, put, uh, fall asleep sooner, less likely to wake up in the night, uh, bother the next, less the next day by daytime sleep dysfunction. How many of you would say you get enough sleep every night? No, but okay, how many of you get? more work from the center, right? Um, we know most people are sleep deprived, right? There's lots of ways to improve the quality and quantity of our sleep. Some of those have side effects. Some of those have side effects with gratitude, though. It actually works. Uh, health behaviors like activity, twice as many steps taken by car uh, coronary patients, high versus low gratitude. For those who are grateful, they're more physically active. Okay? Eat healthier diets. Okay? So sleep, diet, exercise, uh, less likely to abuse substances, and then clinical biomarkers. So the real biomarkers of health, illness, aging, like cortisol reduction, right? You know, cortisol least stress hormone, 23%. It's pretty substantial, right? C-reactive protein, which is a uh, predictor of heart disease, uh, lower levels of fat. And then healthier liver profile. I just saw a review study looking at about 10 studies finding that gratitude was associated with lower systolic, diastolic blood pressure, as well as um, a cholesterol levels, lipid panels, triglycerides, and, and also the um, low density lipoprotein. So many different ways gratitude is impacting us get inside our bodies, under our skins to do things. That gratitude is good medicine, physically, uh, relationally as well as psychologically. So if you want the very quick, short course, people say, so what's the, what's the big news about gratitude? And so I can summarize it in two words, that gratitude works. Okay, well, that's a little bit too short. So maybe you can add a little bit of details to it. Well, gratitude has the power to heal, to energize, and to change lives. And it appears to do so in so many different domains. Now, oh, just one Last quick one, just in case you're interested, workplaces are among those um, domains where they're quite interested in the effects of gratitude. Because it's good for their companies, it's good for employee engagement, morale, all the sorts of organizational metrics that one is interested in in the workplace. So these differences are difference between companies that have employee recognition programs, formal recognition programs where employees are recognized either by management or by peers, a formal program where they get some awards, rewards of various sorts, and those that don't. 
And so you see all the usual metrics, profitability, productivity, less turnover, better customer ratings, fewer safety incidents or accidents, and then less employee theft, which is a multi-billion dollar industry that loss of due to less theft, 28% of that. So you can see the bottom line, it makes a big deal of difference in the workplace. So gratitude is working. There's other data I don't have time to show you in academics, grateful students usually get better grades. Uh, athletics in, in athletes, grateful athletes are more successful. Teams that have gratitude rituals before they uh, play actually are more successful over the long course, uh, long haul of the season. There, there's data on all of those things. Uh, I like to use this little acronym to explain why gratitude works. I say it's the arc of gratitude. And the A stands for amplify, the R stands for rescue, and the C stands for connection or gratitude connects. So first thing gratitude does, it amplifies the good. You know what an amplifier is, right? It's like a microphone or a speaker which turns up the volume. So think of gratitude that way. It's turning up the volume on the good, the good that we see around us, the good that we see in others, the good that we see in our lives, okay? It in, in, uh, improves the signal strength. It magnifies because what our emotional system tends to do is to take the good things for granted. We habituate to it, we adapt to those things, and we have to keep finding new ways to make the good new again. That's why we like novelty, we like change, we like surprise. So gratitude is making good things bigger and better and, and brighter and bolder. So we don't, we don't take those for granted so much. And it helps slow down that uh, wearing off of the pleasures of the good. We can savor those things if we amplify them. And the reason why we need to do that is because our brain by nature does just the opposite. It tends to focus on the negative, right? I'm sure you know this either from personal experience or just you've heard that before. Everyone talks about this. If you go to any talk in the science of happiness or positive psychology, I guarantee at some point, somewhere, someplace, the speaker's gonna talk about the negativity bias of the brain. Our brain latches on to the negative. You know, it's Velcro for the negative. So we focus on what's going wrong. We focus on complaint and criticism and pain and all the bad stuff and the good stuff wears off. The pleasures wear off very quickly, they evaporate. Gratitude helps us. Here's a quote from the Book of Joy written by the Dalai Lama and Archbishop Desmond Tutu. Highly recommend that book. They have a chapter on gratitude and they say, gratitude helps us catalog, celebrate and rejoice in each day and each moment before they slip through the vanishing hourglass of experience. So noticing the positive, turning the value up on that, down on the negative, and then connecting us outward to other people. Okay. So maybe the most important aspect of gratitude is it is connected, it's relational, it's, it's relationship strengthening. Okay. It's in the context of relationships where the power of gratitude is most keenly felt, or the lack thereof also is most keenly felt. Uh, you know, it's what keeps our relationships going uh, without, you know, without gratitude. Think of a relationship without gratitude, a long-term relationship, it just won't last. You know, they would sputter, our relationship would conk out, and we need gratitude, which, which uh, connects us to other people. It um, strengthens the binds between individuals. And even beyond that, you can think of gratitude as more you know, at a societal level, strengthening organizations, workplaces, perhaps even the fabric of society itself, as some sociologists have made that contention. Okay, now we get into what for me is, well, first let's just very quickly, these are just some illustrations. These are people who are mildly to moderately depressed, placed in an experiment with their FCP or gratitude journal. And these were their reactions to being in the study where they were writing about what they were grateful for. These quotes are going to illustrate all those three aspects of the ARC model, amplifying the good, connecting to other people, and then turning down the volume on the bad. I see the good in the people in my life rather than just their faults. Uh, I feel lucky rather than sorry for myself. It brings a smile across my face, helps make the negativity vanish for even a brief moment. Okay. Gratitude works, right? Sounds good. Seems to work in a lot of different domains. Uh, however, there can be some objections. All right. Now, having been having 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 swum in the waters of gratitude for a while now, uh, sometimes people will make some 
uh, comments or objections, not often, but when they do, they're quite, I think, uh, important to consider. You'll see, well, yeah, gratitude works until it doesn't, right? Or no, maybe gratitude doesn't work, right? Uh, gratitude is not the deepest touch point. Uh, in fact, it is problematic one way or another. Generally, what they're saying, you, know, you try to find some common themes or threads. Uh, what, what the point is being made here is that gratitude, instead of being a virtue or a strength, is actually, sign, is actually problematic in one way or another, maybe in multiple ways. And so I've tried to come up with a list of these I've done over the years. As, uh, as I mentioned, I try to learn more and more about the nature of gratitude. That's one of the things that keeps me interested in that I'm learning there's so many levels and notes and notes around. Objections to gratitude, three Ps, okay? Positivity, passivity, and powerlessness. So some would say that uh, gratitude really it's just about all about the good. Focus on the good, look for the good, take in the good, 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 good all the time. What about the bad? What about the realities of life? That life is not always so good, so much fun. It's about, you know, challenges and difficulties and injustices and suffering, all of those things, you know, what about that, they say. Uh, what about um, passivity? Isn't the case that gratitude actually makes you more complacent and passive and apathetic? And that it undercuts ambition, that is the undignified badge of surrender. Isn't that the case that if, you, if you're grateful, you're not going to work so hard? Why do uh, supervisors not want to give gratitude to their employees? I think they won't, they won't be motivated anymore. They want to keep them working uh, and so on, working hard and giving a lot of effort. And then powerlessness, the idea is that it per perpetuates dependency, especially in the case of unhealthy relationships. Instead of being an empowering attitude, it actually is a disempowering one. Okay, uh, just think about it. with gratitude, you have to wait and react to having received a good. Okay, uh, that's, that's a very passive stance to take. I gotta wait for something good at before I can uh, experience the benefits of gratitude. Uh, if, is that the case or not? Well, the arguments go beyond that. The basic idea is that gratitude is uh, really undercuts dissatisfaction, this dissatisfaction, which makes us motivated to want to make changes in the status quo, to engage in behaviors, to restore justices in the case of injustice, and so on. So listen, this gratitude has been referred historically in this way, that it's about maintaining the status quo. It's about complacency in the face of injustice. It's an obstacle that deters the disadvantaged from fighting social, the list goes on, they're all related, a kind of a similar theme there that it underwrites inequality, so on and so forth. So how do we then again adjudicate between these competing views? One says, no, it's a strength, it's a good thing, it's a virtue, this is, no, no, it, it's bad, it, it's a weakness, it's a vulnerability. Uh, we need to be purged of this uh, gratitude that it's better to be dissatisfied or to be, you know, um, have this, you know, anger and so forth, and that'll be motivated. Well, again, I, I can't go through all the arguments, but I want to, consider a couple of cases and articles and points made by people which I take very seriously, uh, very deep arguments, one of which appeared in this article published about seven years ago in a the social and personality psychology compass which publishes theoretical papers. Uh, Richard Eibach that was the first, actually was a PhD from Cornell, I think around 2003. And what they argue in this paper is that there are system justifying the fact of gratitude more. And by this, actually, I put the main points on the next slide, just because the arguments are very dense in this paper. I just want to put up a couple of the main points uh, from it. They propose that gratitude norms. So the norm is like, you should be thankful in this situation. We should, should show gratitude to, you know, to a government, to the people who protect us, first responders, military, the list goes on and on. Okay. Gratitude norms function to motivate people to express system justifying beliefs, system being socio-political, which is largely what they mean. It could be any other large impersonal. So we're going beyond gratitude, beyond the person, beyond even a relationship between two people to a larger, more impersonal uh, system, okay? And so they say, when people feel grateful for the benefits they receive from these institutions, they may feel compelled to express their appreciation by what? By turning down any grievances or complaints they may have. So uh, when you feel grateful okay, to the government or to an institution, 
in the examples they give is that growing up, people are exposed to numerous messages implying that their society's basic institutions are a gift purchased through the sacrifice and struggles of previous generations. Citizens and liberal democracies are told they should be grateful for the numerous rights and freedoms they enjoy. Kind of implicit message that we hear all our lives. So that would tend to make us kind of reticent uh, and oppose and discourage us from expressing dissatisfaction, voicing complaints about injustices uh, for fear we'd be seen as ungrateful people, ingrates. Nobody wants to be seen as an ingrate, right? So gratitude is a virtue, but ingratitude is like an accusation. Uh, you know, it's a vice. You don't want people to think of you as someone who is ungrateful. So gratitude is problematic because of this reason. And when we express system justifying beliefs, we're grateful or appreciative for the benefits we receive that increases our trust and connection to these institutions at the same time, it causes us to want to suppress bad thing, bad things uh, about these, uh, even when there might be a need for system reform or a greater justice or accountability is called for. Okay, hopefully this, this makes sense. I think this is the key essence of their points if I'm not misrepresenting them. So compulsory gratitude, they're saying is bad and they feel gratitude can be compulsory or required in situations like this, in that they're not equally affect, groups are not equally affected across the board. Those who are especially dependent upon these systems, what, whether they're lowest status groups for various reasons, immigrants to new countries, which are told to, to be grateful and to express displeasure is to show ingratitude to the, uh, to the new uh, government, new nation, other social dis disadvantaged groups actually causes them to uh, not express grievances or complaints. So that's a bad thing because you're being asked express gratitude, but in fact, you actually may not be. So that was one, that was the main argument. Now I wanna consider some other cases or uh, studies which are on both sides of that possibility. Okay, it is the case. Study, one study showed, in fact, that gratitude can make a person more susceptible to a social influence. This is called the social alignment perspective. So you take a very powerful person, a very persuasive person, a person asks you to do something, maybe it's not the right thing to do, maybe it's morally questionable for one reason or another. But if you're grateful to that person, you're more likely to say yes, you're more likely to comply. And this is exactly what they showed in this uh, study published a couple of years ago, where they asked people to engage in a behavior, a morally objectionable behavior. And you think, well, how can you do this in laboratory? This is not the 1960s. We can't do the same in Milgram, you know, uh, obedience studies. But let's do something that kind of has the same idea. So this is kind of very clever. I've always thought social psychology is very clever, the way they come up with different experimental designs, you know? So uh, after making a person either grateful or happy or put them in a neutral mood through a different uh, induction laboratory, okay, they were, listen to this. They were given a command by the experimenter not to shock someone like they did with Milgram. This was a command by experimenter to put as many worms as they could into a coffee grinder to be ground. Actually, no worm was actually harmed in the uh, conduct of the experiment, but that was what they were asked to do. They were asked to grind worms in the coffee maker, right? So this is now known now as the worm task, which measures, you know, like brutality or cruelty toward uh, animals. They said, that's okay to do. The, uh, Ethics Committee of the University, they were fine with that. Okay. Now, they didn't actually do that, but people thought they were going to do that. So they, they brought them in the room where they had the coffee grinder, turned it on, you know, made the grinding noise, right, uh, and so on. Uh, but it turned out there was, there was like a, um, a little blockage in the grinder, so the worms wouldn't actually go down there, prevent them from actually hitting the blades, but they didn't know that. People didn't actually know that was happening. Okay. And what they found, when people were, were encouraged, Strongly encouraged to keep putting some worms in the grinder. Those who are placed in a grateful mood by recall, recalling a time where they were grateful were more likely to put more worms in the grinder. Okay. Uh, in fact, I got a picture of it right here. Okay. In fact, three times more 13, 12 worms in the grinder if you were grateful versus nine, uh, 10. And then if you're in a happy mood, you're less likely to take out your happiness you know, by great friends. You, this authority person says, you know, this is what we're doing here. I don't exactly know what the um, context, what the cover story was for the experiment, but it was you know, obviously designed to um, cause a person to engage in a behavior which most people would see as like, intended by your actions, sound gross, right? um, and so on. 
It was only the ones in the graduate condition. Now, when the experiment was actually present, they did another one. I don't have that slide. But when they were present in the room, add a little bit more pressure, you know, to conform, to be obedient. The difference were even greater between the three groups. Suggesting, implying that, okay, gratitude can make a person more susceptible to this kind of influence. Now, of course, and rightfully, they point out that, you know, what's this guy do with the real world? Uh, you know, you wouldn't generalize the findings to what gratitude may make people do in the real world, but it could indicate that, yeah, it might make a person obey commands that are morally questionable or suspect. That certainly is that uh, possibility, okay? Uh, another study came out and said that expressing thanks can undermine low power group protests or so low power group less likely to want to express gratitude because it might undermine the protest that's similar to the argument from the system justification. So that's evidence for that. And then there's a case again by Tony Manella, the philosopher who talks about morally troubling benevolence, right? If someone gives you a gift, but the gift was uh, ill-gotten, right? You get a gift from someone and then you realize they stole the money, for example. Would you still feel grateful? Right, you received the benefit, right? You received the benefit, the person intended to benefit you. And that seemed to meet the criteria for expressing or experiencing gratitude, but now it's a little bit uh, troubling. Or another example he gives is uh, what happens if a doctor out of benevolent concern for a patient lies about certain medical facts in her case to win her a higher spot on the national transplant list, okay? Again, engaged in a you know, ethically suspect behavior, but still got her something that she desperately needed, right? What happens when a benefactor out of benevolent concern does a favor for another person and reveals later that he would not have done the same favor for a person of a different race or fill in whatever other, other group, right? There's a favor there, but these are the cases and he documents these morally troubling benevolence and that you start to think, hmm, there is a kind of a, a darker side here, some problematic aspects of benevolence, giving, receiving benefits, and the experience of gratitude. Okay, on the other hand, we know that gratitude causes people to volunteer to do compassionate work and volunteering work and to go out of their way to help others, often who are less um, privileged than they are. That sounds like gratitude is actually causing people to do good things as opposed to making them complacent or passive or apathetic or you know lazy. Um, this is interesting. I find this interesting here. Okay, so there's research on happiness that goes way back in time, much more research on happiness than on gratitude. And they've looked at issues like this by asking people, they, they wanted to know, are there weaknesses with happiness? Could you be too happy? In some cases, being too happy would not be beneficial. You know, if you're too happy, maybe you don't want to make changes. Maybe you're not motivated. Maybe you're not dissatisfied. So they examined longitudinal data, cross-cultural data all around the world and found that the optimal level of happiness differs depending upon what domain is being examined. So when it comes to relationships, it's best to be at the top of the, the happier you are, the better it is for your relationships, right? Uh, if, you're, if you're less than extremely happy, that could be problematic. In, in some ways, because then maybe, you know, you become dissatisfied, you start to look for other relationships that'll make you happier uh, and so on. But in the domain of doing uh, political uh, participation, political activities or achievement activities in the classroom or on the job, it was better to be slightly less than the extreme level. So, so overall happiness was associated with success in all these different domains, but maximal happiness was best in certain domains, somewhat under the, top level was better in other domains like political participation and volunteer work. So just, it's good to be a little bit slightly dissatisfied. Okay, so that was, um, you could take that as some illustration that, well, um, now there's no equivalent to gratitude. We don't have done studies yet finding it. Is the extreme levels of gratitude always beneficial or are there some weaknesses or shortcomings? But I think we can learn a lesson and extrapolate from the happiness studies because happiness and gratitude are so highly Right. So maybe in some, a little bit of dissatisfaction is okay because it might lead you to want to make changes and improvements and so on. Other evidence showing improves uh, motivation. Okay, we do know that gratitude drives pro-environmental attitudes and civic engagement. So gratitude does in fact lead people to want to engage in behaviors to protect, preserve the environment. There's some good data on that. Recent studies showing that gratitude reduces consumption of depleting resources. People are more likely to become more generous in those cases and use less resources themselves. 
and, and predicts the desire to preserve and protect nature and less likely to want to destroy uh, the environment. So here gratitude is actually helping people making decisions about uh, environmental uh, activism. Okay? A colleague of mine, Andrew Saris, and I wrote an article that was in Time last November, all the ways in which gratitude can help combat climate change. So you can look that up if you're interested. I think we make a fairly good case based on some of these other studies and also questions for the future, why gratitude can be very beneficial for also from an individual, but also a collectivist point of view in helping you know, add to some of the other things going on uh, in terms of you know, national regulations, government regulations, um, market incentives, technological innovations, all of which are very important and necessary, but you know, what can we do on an individual basis? Maybe gratitude and some of these other individual strengths like hope and humility, uh, sense of purpose can be beneficial in terms of actions people can take with respect to uh, engaging in more uh, pro-environmental behaviors. Okay, so I've got three minutes or so left, and I want to now move toward a reconciliation about, so how, how do you put all this together, right? It doesn't make sense. You kind of, when we weigh the pros and cons and try to make sense of it all, let me make five points real quickly, as has been suggested that I should. Uh, one thing we know, okay, we don't feel pure emotions most of the time, right? Gratitude can co-occur with other emotions. You could be grateful. Uh, and uh, anxious at the same time. You can be grateful and have a sense of complaint at the same time, right? You can be grateful and be dissatisfied at the same time. You can be grateful and be a critic at the same time. It doesn't apply because you're great, grateful. You're going to accept a situation in all, all its elements and all of its parts, right? So we know that it will co-occur with other emotions. And so we're, we're playing a balancing game in our minds about how can we be grateful when a person has helped us, but maybe has also harmed us at some time. We have a little mental calculus we need to go through. Most of us realize that because life is full of blended emotional situations. Philosopher by the name of Josh Glasgow talks about holistic versus fragmented gratitude. So you can take a domain, circumstance, event, relationship in your life. Are you totally grateful for every single aspect of it? If that happens, you would have holistic gratitude. Most of the time, maybe even all the time, pretty much close to 99% of the time, our gratitude is more what he calls fragmented. There's aspects of a situation we're grateful for, aspects of a situation we're less grateful for, right? Whether it's a job, whether it's attending Cornell, right? You're grateful for aspects here, right? Great faculty, world-class you know, university, beautiful campus, right? Here we are, high above Cayuga's waters, right? But the weather, today notwithstanding, not always great, right? I mean, there might be other issues, I don't know. Uh, there's a lot of construction around, I see, sometimes close to where people live, and that could be, you know, a problem. So you, you would sort through this, yeah, I'm grateful for this, but this part I don't like, you know? And maybe the gratitude that I have can help me, can help color the parts that I don't like so much. And so the, the good parts of a situation can radiate out goodness and make the bad things less bad and give us a little perspective by which to view them. So that's the idea by Glasgow. Uh, and then there's many ways, and there's lots of cases like this, oh, I wish I could read a couple of them, where well-known activists that, that we know, we recognize all their names, they themselves live, live lives of gratefulness, right? And maybe it wasn't out of their gratitude which um, inspired them or um, compelled them to do the sorts of things that they did, but they were grateful anyway. And they, they showed what could be called a subversive or a defiant gratitude. Who said, you know, I don't like the situation and I'm not doing something about it, but I'm grateful for the opportunity. I'm grateful for the other role models and past activists who've given me the strength to go on to do what needs to be done in this situation. Maybe I'll just give you a brief, uh, uh, I just want to give, just, just to put some, you know, names in real context to all these statistics and science and studies and all. Alice Walker, political activist, right? Segregation, she lost her right eye because she couldn't receive medical attention due to her family's financial situation. She said, thank you is the best prayer that anyone could say. I say that one a lot. Thank you expresses extreme gratitude, humility, and understanding. Maya Angelou, right? She said, let gratitude be the pillow upon which you kneel to say your nightly prayer. And Elie Wiesel, World War II um, activist, uh, Romanian-born author, professor, he was you know, a prisoner in the concentration camps in Auschwitz, 
And he said, when a person doesn't have gratitude, something is missing in his or her humanity. A person can almost be defined by his or her attitude toward gratitude. So we can look to the past, we can look to these role models and, and for ways of reconciling gratitude and gratefulness for life with a desire to make things better and to change. And the reason is because of this. Gratitude is not just a switch to turn on when things go well. It's also light that shines in the darkness. Good thing to remember when you think about when people say it's just positivity, it's positive thinking. This is toxic positivity. I don't want any of that. No, thanks. I won't sign up for it. No, it's not that at all. It's, it's approach to life, which says that there's things to be thankful for, even in the midst of darkness and trials and suffering. So I say gratitude goes way back. It goes way back to the times of Roman philosophers like Seneca. Central to society, to social stability, to a sense of solidarity, right? How else do we live in security if it is not that we help each other through an exchange of good offices? It's only through the interchange of benefits that life becomes fortified against sudden disasters. Take us singly, by ourselves isolated, what are we? 2,000 years later, people are still quoting and citing Seneca, right? Because gratitude goes way back, but we, now we shine a light on it by using the tools of uh, today. Three neuroscientists ended a paper on the neurobiology of gratitude. Where is gratitude in the brain? And this was their conclusion. We nod to Seneca in contending that an empirically driven resurgence of the intentional practice of gratitude could have positive implications, significant implications for the harmony of the human civilization from interpersonal relationships to international diplomacy. Thank you very much. Thank you, Bob. And we're gonna do Q and A in a combination style. So we have a couple of mics that are going back and forth. Um, oh yeah, we have, uh, well, uh, if you, so, so basically if you're in the audience, you can you raise your hands, hands raise your right. and yeah. then you can, we'll get a mic uh, coming to you. We also have a Zoom queue through the Slido, which you all who are shy and don't wanna ask questions or if you wanna do it anonymously, you could always use um, the Slido and up and down vote on it through that link up there. Um, I'll, I'll, while the mic is making its way down there, we have a question here, do we have a mic? Yeah, then we can. Okay, I have a question. Um, I don't study psychology at all, so I have a question about the um, kind of research method. So you said there's some effects about like uh, people who um, who practice gratitude. You know, they sleep better, they eat better, they exercise more. How do you look at causal arrow? I don't even know which way the causal arrow points, but it's not like okay. So, well, so you know, that's a great question about causality, right? So that's the beauty of the experimental method and the randomized controlled trial, right? So you randomly assign people, and the random assignment makes those groups equal in the variable that you're interested in. Okay, so you assume that it would render equal numbers of grateful people, less grateful people in a different condition, right? And so over time, you can actually look at the correlation. You can do, you can predict like um, tonight's sleep based on how grateful you are today. And then grateful you are tomorrow, you can predict that from today's sleep and so on. So you can do all these correlations successfully like that over time, and you can chart up, and then you can see which one predicts what. Uh, in this experimental fashion, controlling for something earlier. So the only, the, yeah, the only way you can do that and to adjudicate that is through the experimental method by right, using randomized assignment. So then if you see a difference between your groups, if they were equivalent from the start, you can say, oh, it's because of that. It was because of gratitude that they became you know, healthier or exercised more. Versus the other way around would be, well, maybe you exercise more, you just feel more great. Right? And that's certainly a possibility. But we actually showed that when people were keeping in journals, they actually moved their exercise from less to more. Right? And that's an excellent question. Right? And that's what you know, reviewers and journal articles will say that, well, how do you know it's not just gravity, it's not happiness, you know, which is driving your findings or optimism or just being liked by other people, whatever it is. Well, we can, we can statistically control those other variables and show what, what gratitude uniquely predicts when you take off all the others out of the equation. Uh, question for yeah. Um, what, you know, what habits do you put into practice in your own daily life to sort of try to implement your research? How have you lived it out? Yeah, so I'll give one answer for me and another answer for my family. Uh, uh, so, uh, confession, I don't keep gratitude journal. I never have, even though I say it's really <laughs> Because the reason is, because one size doesn't fit all. 
And some people, and I've talked to some of you guys here yesterday at the student meeting and uh, before Peter talked to you about that. The graduate journal was really good, especially in the early stage of develop, developing a practice. You want to take your thoughts and, and feelings and write down, put it down on paper, and it forces you to do so in, in a very controlled way, a very intentional way, like any practice, right? So think of spiritual practice, you know, maybe it's meditation, maybe it's prayer, maybe it's something else. And journaling can be really effective for that reason. Some people, though, journaling it, it becomes uh, becomes a burden. It becomes too much work. It becomes one more thing to do on an already busy to-do list. It's like, you know, uh, I got classes to go to. I got a job. I got family relationships. You one thing after another. And then you're asking me to keep a gratitude journal. Like, forget it. So when they do it, it becomes, you know, just a pain to actually toss off. It doesn't really create this this fullness and freedom to life that we want it to do. It becomes more, much more a burden. It makes life heavy for them, not lighter. So I say them, well, find the practice that works for you. And so we know one size doesn't fit all. Some people would like to write letters of gratitude occasionally to people who are very important to mentors or they'll post on the social media who they're grateful to or broadcast their gratitude to others. So I have a model I call the aware, declare, and share model. So you're aware of your gratitude, just become aware of it mentally, reflect on it. Okay? Then you may decide to declare or share that with other people. You may not. Some people are better at it. Uh, internally, just reflecting privately. Some people are just more outgoing, extrovert. They like to spread their gratitude, broadcast that to others. That works great too. Uh, but one one side does not fit all. We get mics back uh, there. Um, so, a question from the Zoom here. It's almost like one of disbelief, but with with the depression studies, how can you influence depressed people? You know, using these seemingly really small interventions. That like suddenly like how, how could gratitude make that impact? Yeah, so I mean every day it seems like on a regular basis I was seeing findings that were hard to believe. It's just you know high popping drug dropping kind of find really it changed your blood pressure. And you know I mean you got to think medication changes blood pressure. Are you saying that you know right this which you break? Well, well, if you do it regularly enough and consistently and intentionally, you can start to have changes over time. Usually there's small changes, but small changes can be magnified if you practice it enough. Just like physical exercise or change your diet. Do you see the impact right away? Unlikely, right? But you will see it over time if you stick with it. Uh, sure, I mean, so we know that lots of different uh, cognitive behavioral therapies work with depression. Uh, and gratitude can be one of the elements. Now, would you throw out everything else and just say do gratitude journaling and not you know, focus on other aspects of things you want to change, the ways you look at life, or irrational beliefs that we have? In some cases, depression is biological. And you need biological treatments, but at least with the mild to moderate depression, those are the kind of people you saw with their quotes about why they thought gratitude was effective for them. So, yeah, small uh, effects at first, but can magnify and grow, multiply over time if you practice this in a consistent way. I'm going to ask you to stand right oh. behind here to can't let the mic pick you up for our Zoom audience. Um, we have a question over there. Do you have the mic? Thank you so much for this talk. Uh, so how do we internalize uh, the practice of gratitude being coming from a genuine place? Could you repeat the question? How do we internalize the practice of gratitude coming from the last thing? Genuine place. So how do we make sure that our gratitude is genuine? Mm -hmm. So I, I suspect genuine gratitude, you're talking more about the expression of gratitude rather than your internal feeling of it. Uh, I'm talking more about the latter. So the internal feeling of gratitude being very genuine. So is it something that we keep practicing or yeah. is it like you fake it till you make it? Well, you can do that actually, because we know that. Is your phone? That's your timer. That, sorry, can't. <laughs> that um, behavior change will often lead to attitude change. So we do something, if we act happy, if we smile a lot like you are, you go, we're going to be happier, right? And they've actually established that in experiments by asking people to move their facial muscles in the way which activate the, the happiness muscles and they actually become happier subjectively. So expressing gratitude actually does make us feel more great. We start to feel the gratitude that we're living if we live it. But generally, you know, if you use, so gratitude is based on noticing benefits. Um, identifying things in your life as gifts that were given to you by someone else. You say, wow, what a gift I have right now to, you know, whatever. You just think gratefully about some aspect of your life. Can you see it as a gift? See it as a benefit? Think, well, maybe, maybe I don't deserve this. Chesterton did that all the time. Chesterton said, you know, I, you know, uh, what a sunset I saw today. 
you know, and I'm going to have another day tomorrow. I don't deserve this, you know, and so he had this kind of hum uh, humble or attitude of humility, which kind of made it possible for him to see gifts and see benefits. So you use the language of gifts, givers, benefits, focus on people doing things for you that you couldn't necessarily do for yourself. And that's a really good uh, technique. It's just, just think of one person who was kind to you in the last 24 hours. So start very specifically, very concretely, and that will activate gratitude. Then before you know it, you start to find more and more things to be grateful for. And that's what people report in the gratitude journal studies. Thank you so much. Oh, we have a question right next to you. Why don't you go ahead? Um, so have we ever like looked at how the impact of gratitude changes over time? So like if I've been doing gratitude exercises for like 40 years, is that can have like a similar impact to someone who has been doing it for like one or like uh, <laughs> we ever considered that? Yeah, so the question, how, how long do you have to be doing it to see a positive impact or what's the effect of doing it long term for a long period of time? Sure, uh, we, well, we do know that just in terms of like age changes. So older people tend to be more grateful than younger people. And it's a pretty linear relationship, right? So as you get older, you know, a lot of things decrease as you get older. But one thing that goes up is your gratitude levels. Actually, happiness levels go up as well. Now, is that due to, you know, long-term practice or just kind of a new way of looking at life where you just, you know, uh, you really, you've been through a lot, you have perspective now, that sort of thing. So there's lots of reasons to account for that pattern. But yeah, I think it's like, oh, the price. So the longer you, you're at it, the more benefits that you see. Now, you can also experience the pretty immediate benefits. Uh, there is, you know, there is a now power to gratitude that if you just right now think about something you're grateful for, an event, a person, something happened today, you actually start to feel changes inside, right? That are then going to be magnified if you experience those on a regular and frequent basis. But if you yeah, do that regular enough, you'll start to reap the benefits over time. Now, sometimes though, what can happen is that there can be a little bit of backfiring. So if you, people can experience what's called gratitude fatigue. And that's like those who journal and ask to do it so many times you start to think about this is kind of a pain. This is so stupid. This is hokey. This is a cheesy, all that stuff. You get tired of doing it. You know, you think this is such a pain. It's a burden. So the important thing to do is to keep your gratitudes fresh, change them all the time, make them very specific, write about things that are surprising, keep it new, keep it fresh. One study found that if you did it twice a week, it was better than if you did it seven times a week, just because you get to think of this physical exercise. You don't go to the gym every day, right? Gary, you don't lift weights every day, but you need time for your muscles to recover, recuperate. So it is, maybe you need time for your gratitude muscles to recover, recuperate well by spreading out the practice over time. We can bring the mic down here. And while, while we're doing that, we have a question. How, and this actually touches on, we didn't talk about you did in the most kind of, the later years of your career, you started moving to gratitude to God, like yes. doing research on, on the religious aspects of gratitude. Um, and the question here is, how does the object of the gratitude shape these outcomes? Is it different when one is grateful for their dog versus for something that God does or for God, God's self? <laughs> yeah, so um, like I mentioned, there's many different sources of gratitude, right? We, we, we are grateful for beings that are providing us with some benefit. Uh, God and our dog can provide us with benefits that other people can't especially if you have a golden retriever like we do, you get certainly you know, unconditional love and many people get that from, from God and their supernatural uh, beings as well. So some similarities there. Um, the idea is that we are receiving a benefit, a gift that is in some cases very costly for the giver. We know they intended to benefit us. Now it's not costly for the dog to be affectionate. It's not costly for God to give us gifts according to most traditions. Yet we experience gratitude anyway because we received a gift of so much uh, magnitude that's something that we couldn't do for ourselves you know people who are grateful just to be alive as Chesterton was you know why do I deserve to be alive he said uh, you know and all these other statements were focused on his awe and wonder just the sheer you know why is there something rather than nothing he said he knew that he wasn't responsible for it so he found a giver he found a cosmic giver to make his gratitude complete. So I, I do think we think we search for sources of what we're grateful for. It's part of a cosmic search or a spiritual quest. For some people, that's God as the ultimate giver. For some people, it's, it's, it's uh, a cosmic giver. Some people, it's karma. For some people, it's the universe. But we do, I think it's a fundamental tendency that we have to try to explain where these good things come from. And that is a, is a deep spiritual quest, which makes gratitude a spiritual quality. 
Yeah, um, sort of connected to that last answer. Um, my sophomore year, uh, outside my window in Chester, there was a banner in the parking lot that said, there was a, a quote from Chester that said, um, gratitude is happiness doubled by wonder. Um, and you offered a definition of gratitude that was like the acknowledgement of goodness that exists outside of yourself. Um, so I guess, where was Chester in getting that idea of wonder from, and how do you see wonder factoring into gratitude? So, I mean, he got it from his own life, right? I mean, he was just amazed by everything. He lived in this constant state of wonder, amazement. He lived under an aura of pervasive thankfulness. You know, it was like the banner under which he lived his life. Uh, and, you know, I, I haven't read as widely uh, in the minute as, as I would like, but I suspect he, he just was so, um, he was like a child, had this childlike sense of, of wonder, of curiosity by stuff. And there's a quote about how he's, he's like, he's writing because he was a prolific writer. He wrote like, I don't know, 100 books or whatever, you know, and weekly columns for his newspaper. And he stopped writing one time. He was so amazed by the, the ink in his pen that he was like, you know, dumbfounded by, he was like paralyzed by how, how inky the ink was in his pen. And he thought like, how, how what do you say? He said like, how, how muddy mud is, how steely steel is. He just like had this wonder for everything, like this childlike sense of wonder, which, uh, you know, most of us lose after we're three or four years old, but he tried to maintain them. And that's what he was grateful for, the sense that things don't have to be. When you notice something in its entirety, he's like amplifying the good. He's noticing all the layers and levels and things become bigger and better and brighter. And that was just the way he saw it. That was just the, you know, the, the world view that he had. He just saw things through these eyes of wonder. And I mean, that's a great place to be. All right. It, it would slow you down if you stopped and, you know, wondered about everything that you looked at and thought, well, how did they make this? Where did it come from? And so on. But it's a very rich way of living. And people now are actually looking at psychological richness as an important element of flourishing and subjective well-being. We thought for a long time it was just happiness, high happiness, low happiness, satisfaction, contentment. And now some research are looking at this concept of psychological richness, which is this uh, conglomeration of like meaning, purpose, sense of wonder, sense of curiosity, which together is a pretty nice portfolio of strengths to have. Other questions? Uh, hands up while Peter finds you. I'm going to read... Uh... Uh, the next question in the queue. Um, are there gratitude studies, I think this is related to the fragmented like, kind of picture here. Are there gratitude studies that have used methods of acknowledging say negative aspects or struggles in conjunction with also acknowledging the positive? So this, a practice that is actually like, you know, trying to fragment appropriately. Yep, so in fact, uh, one of the best ways that we know of to activate gratitude, actually to focus on things that have gone wrong in your life. Okay, and that actually is a way to counter that argument that gratitude is all about just looking for the good and positivity. So I call this um, remembering the bad. So remember the bad times, remember the struggles, the trials, the difficult times, relationships that broke up, plans that didn't work out, illnesses, whatever. But then look where you are now, okay, and compare yourself, right? And see that, hey, I survived that. I made it through that dark time, that dark night. I survived that bad thing. And so that offers a comparison to evaluate your life now based upon what ha happened previously. Because we, we know our minds are comparison making machines. They, they, they make these uh, comparisons that call counterfactual thinking. We think about how our life now was or could be or used to be. And sometimes those work against our ability to be happy and content. They, they hijack our consciousness so it's impossible to be grateful. But sometimes we can use comparisons to our, to our advantage. And one way to do that is focusing how we recover from the bad thing. And now we've, we've, we've moved beyond that. We've learned strengths. We've, we've gained gratitude, gained appreciation. We now know that we can go through things like that again. So they call that you know trauma-related growth or stress-related growth. And gratitude plays a big role in creating that, making that possible. So I'm going to jump here with a question. So uh, one thing I wonder is if, how much of the problems or objections here are actually related toward norms of expressing gratitude. So yeah. this idea that like you should be grateful, like that sort of thing, like, um, well, gratitude, it's not gratitude directly, but then there's a company instead of social practices, which say yeah. this sort of group ought to be grateful for this to uh, this other group or something like that. And if you violate that, now all this other stuff. Right, is, right, right. So it's almost accessories to gratitude, which are so, and if so, then are there worse practices? Are there things we shouldn't do? Around. Like, so for example, I'm thinking of parenting when you have like all these enforced rituals with your kids, like say thank you, make sure you say yeah, so We just went through Halloween and trick or treat, you did this a million times. Is that bad? Is that actually setting up the well, We make comparisons with those who are less fortunate because you should clean your plate because the children in Africa are starving and all those sorts right. of things, which you know we know are never working and not motivational uh, at all. Uh, we do know that expressing gratitude is a way to get people to change the behavior and showing them unconditional love and support is much better than um, punishing them because they're not grateful. 
or I mean, I think of gratitude is I think of it as an invitation. You know, I mean, one of the risks about studying and writing about and talking about something like gratitude is because we hear messages all our lives, and people will come <laughs> out with sometimes think, oh, he's telling me to be more grateful. Uh, you know, so there's this pushback sometimes for that reason. And what I like to say is, no, I mean, this is an invitation to adopt gratitude practices. Why? Well, because we know X, Y, Z does these things. We know it brings people a new lease on life. We know it gives them a sense of wholeness and wellness and fullness and stress reduction, all of those good things, right? It's like, if you want those, try this out. Maybe it doesn't work for you. Maybe try something else, okay? But here's what we know from the science. So I try to be more descriptive than prescriptive, but it's easy to cross over that boundary when you do work in positive psychology because that's the nature of what we study. If we study forgiveness and do the signs of forgiveness, people study that. They do that because they think forgiveness is a good thing. We need more forgiveness. I think gratitude is a good thing. We need more of that, right? It can bring about some of these effects that we see not just individually, but also at a larger corporate, even global level. Gratitude is never a should for me. It's always a could, it's always a possibility. We have time for one more question. There, uh, we have one in Zoom here. It says, "I like what you said about being grateful and, but what do I do with that distinction or statement once I make it?" Grateful and. So I'm assuming this is the idea of uh, fragmentation of being able to, with the specific respect you're grateful. Yeah. For I mean, part of it's just the reality of the situation, right? There are many, multiple, sometimes conflicting elements in a situation, and we're not going to be grateful for for all of those, and it wouldn't be realistic or practical uh, to do that. But can the gratitude uh, exceed the negative aspect of that situation, right? Can the, can the goodness of the, of the good things, of the good elements radiate to the bad things so that maybe it doesn't make the bad things disappear or make them less bad, but they become overpowered by choosing to focus on the good things in that situation. And maybe the bad things are telling you some important information, right? Because emotions are information that are telling us that we need sometimes to make changes or make decisions. That's why I think that that big study found that you know some dissatisfaction is beneficial because it motivates us to you know make the decisions that we need to make in those situations so that we can you know flourish and, and live those lives uh, that we can if we're just you know focusing on ignoring or overlooking or denying the bad things or going through difficult times and. Uh, situations which are oppressive. And we can't be grateful in all situations. Nobody ever said that. I never heard a person who was a gratitude guru <laughs> say, you know, you should be grateful in all circumstances, you know, because obviously there's things we cannot be grateful for, for abuse, for war, for poverty, for oppression, for oppressive regimes and all these things. And I don't think anyone suggests that. They're saying that, can you find things to be grateful for despite the fact you're going through these? It may be Gratitude can be beneficial, can give you some strength or some courage, some resilience in these contexts to, to deal with, to face what you have to face in your situation. Okay, and I think we're hitting time. So would you join me in a non-coerced, non-mandatory <laughs> expression of gratitude for Bob Evans? Thank you so much, Bob. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Now, thank you to all of you all in Zoom. Uh, a lot of you mm -hmm. who have been watching patiently, we appreciate it. Uh, for those of you in the room, we actually have a reception prepared outside and please take advantage of this. Uh, Bob would love to actually talk to people in person. So come and ask your questions so the conversation can continue outside. Um, also, uh, he will also be at the Knoll tomorrow morning in our public reading scripture that we do every week. So you can accost him there as well. Um, uh, in the meantime, we are going to tear down and move like the logistics of a Halloween pop-up store in November. We have to vacate this room because there's a prelim starting at 710. So we have five minutes to move everybody and everything out. And so uh, let's reconvene outside in, in, the, uh, in the lobby. Thank you all so much. All right, so, so that's yours.